Hi, I'm Miranda and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I'm doing part two of my January reads. I did part one um, a week or so ago, but I've read a pile of books since then and I'm going to share those with you too. So first up, Three Hours by Rosamond Lupton. This is a proof copy of the book that I've got. It's actually out in hardback now. It came out in January. And this makes a really spectacular winter read. It's set in the present day and it, it starts in the midst of a school shooting at a private school that's known for its liberalism just outside of Bath in the UK. So it's a really, really tense read. It's every teacher, every parent's worst nightmare. And it takes place over the course of three hours when the school is on lockdown. The headmaster has been shot. No one knows who the shooters are or why this is happening, why they're attacking the school. So they don't know if it's a terrorist attack or if it's disgruntled former students. So you partly follow the story of the students and the teachers who are trapped in school and then you also follow the story of the police detective who essentially analyses what the shooters are most likely to do next. She tries to understand who they are, what they're going to do next and how best to negotiate with them. And then you also follow the story of one parent in particular as she goes through the most awful ordeal that you can imagine. I don't want to give any of the plot away because there are lots of twists and turns to this and I think that it's really tightly plotted and very well done in that way. My only quibble with the book is there's one shooter who comes in more at the end of the story and there's been a real build up in some ways as to who this is and he just kind of dwindles away at the end. You don't really know who this person really was or why he was involved or what was really happening with this person. And to me, that actually is quite a weakness in a very tightly plotted book. And I wonder if the end result um, has written that better, if it's because I've read a proof copy, I'm not sure. But that was just one thing that bothered me about the book. The rest is really well written. I especially liked her nods to literature in this book and to the importance of culture. I actually wrote down a favourite quote of mine from this book. Hold on, let me get it. So I love this reading journal that I use and I write down little reviews of the books that I've read but I also write down um, favourite quotes. So one, so a quote from this that I put down is, he'd understood then why Baba, that's someone's father, quoted from playwrights and poets, he was using great culture to articulate the opposite of culture. And the opposite of culture is shown very much to be um, ignorance and violence and terror. Some of the children are trapped inside the theatre unaware of where the gunman may be in the grounds outside of the school but they're quite safe in the theatre it's the safest building in the school because there aren't any windows and there's only one door um, that would be very hard to break through so as they're sort of receiving texts from their friends outside of the theatre and wondering what's happening to stay sane they practice acting well, they do a dress rehearsal of Macbeth, the play that they were meant to actually be rehearsing and performing that day in the school. And themes of that are in Macbeth, Lupton sort of reflects in the students trying to understand violence, trying to understand murder, but also it's shown as a way that the students actually end up surviving is through their love of culture and how that actually gives them real bravery 
and courage at a very critical time. Elsewhere in the book, students use books as a literal barrier. They pile books up against a door to stop one of the gunmen from coming into the door. So I really loved that. I loved how she showed the importance of literature and culture. But it is a very harrowing read at the same time. I mean, especially as a former teacher, like I said, this is just your worst nightmare happening. But I thought she dealt with difficult subject matter very well. And it's all set in the winter. There's this horrible snowstorm that's taking place on this day. So in that way, it's also a very good winter read. And it's just hard to put this book down. You'll want to keep reading right to the end. So I definitely recommend this one. This book, Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont by Elizabeth Taylor was a reread for me. I love Elizabeth Taylor's writing. She is not the Elizabeth Taylor who's the famous actress. Uh, she's a different person, but she was writing and publishing a lot in the 1940s through to the early 1970s. And Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont was the last novel that was published in Taylor's lifetime. I think it was, uh, nominated, possibly even shortlisted, I'm not quite sure, for the Booker Prize and it is just an extraordinary book. This is the first edition that I really prize but there's also a lovely uh, paperback Virago edition that you can get now too. Mrs Palfrey starts on a day in January, so again this book is a very good winter read. It starts when Mrs Palfrey arrives at the Claremont Hotel where she's going to become a permanent resident. She can't keep living on her own, her, her health isn't up to that and her family don't really want to take her in. This book is really about loneliness, it's about the loneliness of old age. Mrs Palfrey meets a younger man by chance and in a funny sort of twist he ends up posing as her grandson who has been failing to visit her at the hotel. This young man actually ends up visiting Mrs Palfrey and becoming more like a grandson to her than her real grandson. But even his motivation isn't exactly selfless and like I said this is a real book about loneliness, about the sadness of getting older and for that reason it is quite a difficult read in some ways and that I find this a very sad book but it's also just an extraordinary book. I mean I love Elizabeth Taylor's writing. She's such a brilliant, brilliant writer. She can convey so much in only a few sentences and if you haven't read any of her books before then I completely recommend you getting them and Mrs Palfrey at the Claremont would be a good place to start. Next I read this memoir, A Bite of the Apple by Lenny Goodings. Uh, again this is a proof copy and this is going to be out on the 27th of February. Lenny Goodings is chair of the publishing company Virago and she was the publishing director of Virago for, for many years, she's also an editor. So this essentially is a history both of Virago and of her career and the importance that Virago has within the feminist canon of literature. They publish so many feminist books and books by women, about women. This book is also a lot about the, the rise of feminism, post-feminism and then what's happening with feminism now. Lenny Goodings was with Virago from when she was quite a young girl starting out in the 1970s and it's just fascinating to read about those early days of Virago, what motivated this group of women to start the publishing company, um, the trials that they faced along the way, there were many challenges they had to overcome, but also the amazing work that they did and Lenny also writes about some of the authors that she personally worked with. So people like Maya Angelou and Margaret Atwood, Lenny is also Canadian so she had that connection with Margaret Atwood and it was it's just such a wonderful read. I was so enjoying 
this book I didn't want it to end but I really recommend you getting this one as well if you're interested in in publishing if you're interested in women's writing then really this I think is quite an essential read. This was another non-fiction book that I read this month it's called Surfacing by Kathleen Jamie. I talked about this as my short form literature choice for the latest tea reads episode on tea and tattle podcast so I'll put a link to that discussion in the uh, box down below if you want to check it out. Kathleen Jamie is a Scottish poet and writer and the fact that she is a poet I think explains why her prose is so lyrical. Um, she writes absolutely beautifully and in this book it's all about this theme of surfacing, so how memories from the past can resurface in your mind, how history can resurface, so she goes on some archaeological digs and writes about what's uncovered and the messages that you can read from the past, memories of that she has of stories told by her mother, her grandmother come up again and sometimes these memories provide real comfort. Um, she writes at one point about having this dream of an incident that occurred when she was a young girl um, in Tibet and this dog bit her ankle and this dream in fact gave her some solace when she was just diagnosed with cancer and she felt this conviction that actually the cancer was just like a nip, just like this small bite that she actually would get over. Like I said her writing is really lyrical, I love passages in particular where she describes where she describes her native landscape of Scotland. She's a very talented nature writer and yes this was just a really thought-provoking enjoyable read so I enjoyed this one a lot too. I have to say I've been very lucky with my reading choices this month. I've enjoyed all of them. I think I worked out that I've read 15 books and then I've also listened to some uh, audible books this month as well so it's been quite a big uh, reading month for me. One of the audible books I read was well read <laughs> listened to was Emma by Jane Austen. I mean I've <laughs> read and listened to this so many times. The audible version I have is Emma read by Jenny Agatha and she's such a great reader for Emma, I absolutely love um, that version read by her. But Emma is one of my favourite Jane Austen novels, I wanted to listen to it because the film of Emma, the new film is coming out this month so I wanted to refresh my mind with the plot and yes so that was just a delight listening to Emma. I listen to at least one Jane Austen book a month, I'm now on Persuasion and with audiobooks I tend to re-listen to books, well the same sorts of books over and over again, so Jane, Jane Austen and then things like um, P.G. Woodhouse is one of my favourite authors to listen to as long as you get Jonathan Cecil reading them, he is the best reader for P.G. Woodhouse, they just bring the books alive so much. So this month I listened to Joy in the Morning by P.G. Woodhouse, one of my favourite Jeeves and Worcester books that one, and I also listened to some Agatha Christie, I listened to The Murder on the Links which is a Hastings and Poirot mystery, only I think the second Hastings and Poirot uh, mystery is it's one of the very early ones where Captain Hastings falls in love and it's uh, it's it's really fun that one and I also listened to The Murder at the Vicarage which is the first Aga uh, with the first Miss Marple mystery and such a classic I love that one but back to the books that I've physically read this month so Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reid was uh, I thought a really really strong debut novel it's about a young black woman called Amira who is a babysitter uh, to quite an affluent uh, sort of white middle class family in Philadelphia and 
the book starts when Amira is called up by uh, Alice, the mother of the two children that she looks after, and is asked to take one of the daughters to the local grocery store. Amira does this, but while she's there, she's accosted by the security guard uh, at the grocery store who accuses her of having possibly kidnapped the child or he's very suspicious as to why essentially a black woman is there with a white child quite late at night. Events unfold from this. And I think that Kylie Reid is just such a smart, um, perceptive writer. She writes about issues of race and status amongst women. This book made me think about so many different things. And yes, another one I would really recommend. And then finally, Square Haunting by Francesca Wade. I was so looking forward to reading this book. I was really delighted when it finally came out in print and I could buy it and read it. Um, it says, Five Women, Freedom and London Between the Walls. And Francesca Wade has taken, oh, I, I do actually just want to show you the M papers. I think those are so beautiful. It's a really beautiful book. This flapper comes off. And that's the front. It's published by Faber and I think they've done a really, really stunning job with this. But Francesca Wade takes one square within London called Mecklenburg Square and she discovered that five women lived there who all had quite extraordinary stories to tell and were all sort of very important literary women. The five women that she writes about are HD, which was short for Hilda Doolittle, Dorothy L. Sayers, uh, the famous crime writer. Then she also looks at Jane Ellen Harrison, who was a classicist and a translator. Eileen Power, who was a um, historian. She worked for LSE and she was also a broadcaster. And then the final woman is Virginia Woolf. And what Francesca does is she really takes Virginia Woolf's famous essay, um, a, R a Room of One's Own, and she showed that all of these women were in fact searching for a room of their own that would allow them to produce the work that they all became famous for. And so that their choice in moving to that area of Bloomsbury wasn't just by chance. These women in, didn't really end up there by some fluke or some strange coincidence. It was very much the environment of Bloomsbury in sort of pre-World War One and then the sort of interwar years um, is really the time period that she's writing about. And Bloomsbury at that time was known for flouting um, societal conventions and norms and these women wanted to do something different with their lives than what was really expected of women at that time. So they all wanted to write but they also really wanted their intellectual and creative freedom as well as their personal freedom. So they needed an atmosphere in which they could flourish and for most of them, they found that in Bloomsbury, in this particular part of London, where so many people were doing things a little bit differently. There were so many writers and artists and even dancers who were living in this area. I absolutely loved this book. I can't recommend it highly enough. I found it so inspirational to me now even because I think women still need a room of their own. They need that financial independence, they also need that intellectual freedom, they need the support of people who believe in what they do and this was just like I said such an inspiring read to me. I was amazed by some of the things that linked these women, not just their work but some some of them even shared lovers, even though they were almost a generation apart. 
it was so fascinating to read about this area of London, this time in history, how these women were linked uh, living in this same part of London, but also why their work was so important to them and how that was a real driving force of their success and how they all wanted to do something different than get married and have children. If they, Even if they did want to get married, they did not want their marriage to cause them to sacrifice their personal career ambitions. That's something that speaks very much to me, even as a woman today. So there's so much about this book that I think will resonate with women today as well, and that will help empower women today too. So yes, I absolutely loved this. If you're interested in the Bloomsbury group, in uh, female writers in writing yourself, then I really recommend getting this. It's an outstanding book. So that's it, all of the books that I have read in January. There was obviously a part one to my January reads. I'll link that up here and also in the box down below if you'd like to watch that and you haven't already because I read some really great books at the start of the month too. But I uh, thank you so much for watching this video. As always, do give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And let me know what books have you read in January, which were some of your standout reads from the month. I'd love to get some recommendations. But thanks again for watching. Remember to subscribe to my channel. You can just click my face that pops up here. Um, to subscribe but I'll be back again very soon with another video and until then bye